I'm going to be talking about uh, some recent work on uh, related to Simon's talk and Sanji's on neural tangent kernels and then how to go beyond uh, neural tangent kernels. Okay, so quickly remind everyone what is the idea behind neural tangent kernels. It's a very simple Taylor series. Take any nonlinear function, um, for example, your network. I write it as f of w0 plus a change w. Uh, and then you simply Taylor expand. Um, due to the scale, way things are scaled, generally we'll think of this term as very small. There's a term here that depends on w squared. And then, uh, then what's left over is just this linear term. And so you can see that uh, when w is very small, you move a small amount from your random initialization. You're roughly, uh, your, your nonlinear function can be approximated by a linear function. Okay, um, so this is the fundamental observation of these papers. Um, if you move, if you stay close to random initialization, you behave like a linear model. And of course, if these linear features, you stack them into a Jacobian matrix, this matrix is full rank, then there's also a global minimizer. Uh, essentially, using this observation, there were several papers simultaneously that showed uh, theorems sort of like this. They basically said that uh, nearby random initialization, you can find the global, there is a global minimizer, and gradient descent, in fact, does go to global minimizer um, near the random initialization. And the proof is nothing but the linearization that we wrote earlier, is you simply have your loss. It's very close to the loss of the linear model. The gradient is very close to that of the linear model. So the gradient descent on the neural net is approximately gradient descent on a linear model. We know how to analyze gradient descent on a linear model as many good properties, the training error converges to zero, and the linear, since the linear model is strongly locally, strongly convex. Okay, um, soon, soon after, people realize that, of course, if you have a linear model, there's always a corresponding kernel, and you can start thinking about an infinite width limit, uh, and then and then these people, they proved that uh, if you're wide enough, gradient descent, in fact, does become a kernel method with a certain kernel written here known as the neural tangent kernel. Okay, so I think this is probably all a review of what Simon already talked about. Okay, uh, the, it's very nice that we know what happens in this infinite width limit because uh, it allows us a way to analyze the sample complexity. Uh, the sample complexity of kernel methods is relatively well understood. In fact, we know it's proportional to an RKHS norm uh, so you can have results like this to learn to epsilon error. Okay, uh, but there are several limitations uh, with Tenyu and Colin Wei. We showed a sample complexity gap of order dimension D for neural tangent kernels and all of these kernels that are essentially rotationally invariant. Uh, for a classification setting, essentially you have a function that looks like a two XOR, so XOR on two coordinates. Uh, if you go, you're going to use a kernel method, you're going to need d squared samples to learn, uh, whereas you really only should use order d samples. Um, Gorbani, May, and Montanari showed a similar result uh, in the regression setting. Essentially, they showed that for all rotationally invariant kernels, if your sample size is less than d to the l plus one minus delta, that you can only do as well as the degree l um, polynomial kernel. So a uh, rotational invariant kernels cannot, if you only have d to 2.9 samples, you're, you can't learn better than a quadratic kernel, more or less, that's what the Gorbani paper says. A uh, similar result for uh, Yehuda and Shamir show that a uh, single ReLU can potentially have very, very large RKHS norm. Uh, Alan Zhu and Li also showed a lower bound, and they in fact have an upper bound algorithm too. Okay, so uh, these works are all pointing to certain limitations of rotationally invariant kernels. Okay, uh, so what is the intuition of why uh, kernel methods don't work in these, in these examples? It's actually very, very simple. Uh, your signal is entirely localized on one direction or a very, very small number of directions. 
Uh, for example, consider a function that's beta transpose x to a power squared, let's say. Uh, the kernel method, a rotationally invariant kernel, will essentially treat this as a linear classifier on degree two monomials. So it's going to learn something, a W star inner product that features xx transpose. And of course, if you're going to learn something of that form, you're going to need d squared samples. And what you've lost is this is not an arbitrary uh, degree two thing. This is, in fact, a rank one. This W star is rank one. And the kernel method has kind of lost this information. OK. Uh, so essentially, these things, I'll loosely refer to these as low rank <laughs> polynomials, is that if your target function is sort of like low rank or only a few directions matter, uh, your sample complexity should always be d here. Even if you have beta transpose x to the 15th power, it should be d. Um, but we don't know how to algorithmically attain these. Uh, in the paper with Tenyu and Colin, we showed it can be done with weight decay, assuming, the weight, assuming you can optimize a regularized objective. And for this very, very special case of when it's squared, with Simon, we showed how to do this with SGD. But in general, it's unclear how to uh, start to leverage this sort of low rank or la low latent dimension structure via optimization. OK. On the other hand, uh, there's been a lot of results on the inductive bias of SGD. Uh, for example, weight decay on two-layer networks is equivalent to an L1 on a space in neurons, which suggests it's doing feature learning, representation learning, because from all the possible ReLU features, it's selecting a sparse number of them. Um, in quadratic activation or matrix sensing, uh, what essentially happens is you can learn a low dimensional linear subspace, although instead of looking in all directions, you only have to look in a small number of directions. Uh, similarly, in deep linear nets, Sanjeev mentioned this, is that you can have a deep linear network trained via gradient descent, and it'll return to you something that's sort of low dimensional. We don't know exactly if it's low rank, but in some sense, it's low dimensional. And of course, there's results that suggest SGD induces weight decay. And on rigorously, you could see, OK, it induces weight decay, so it's doing representation learning. That's not formal, but you would hope that something like this happens, is that SGD can discover these low dimensional latent structures somehow. OK. So what is common in all of these sort of suggestive results, uh, and they're all asymptotic, and they're not, none of these are polynomial time except the quadratic activation case is that you have to move substantially from random initialization. All of these require you to essentially kind of forget where you initialize that and move like an order one away. Assuming my neurons are initialized order one, I need to move also order one. OK, so the rest of this talk is how to systematically utilize more of the parameter space. Uh, and let me tell you how I do this. OK, so the only thing I'll use ever is Taylor series. Uh, I take my neural net and I simply expand to higher order. OK, so we have two terms now. I have the linear term, f1, which is exactly what NTK is, and f2, which is a quadratic term. And there's some higher order terms that I'll talk about at the end of the talk. But for the next 20 minutes, let's pretend we only have these first two terms. Uh, and my wr is the offset from w0. It's not the parameter itself. It's how much you moved from w0. OK, uh, so let's think about if uh, the scaling of these, the relative scaling of these two terms is that if you move a small amount, anything less than one, then we would expect the linear term to dominate the second order term. Uh, this is bad news if you ever want to go beyond the first order term, because the, fir the first order term is dominant, which is exactly how all these NTK things are sort of proved. It's, it's dominant, so it's the only one that matters. <coughs> OK. Uh, so then you would think, OK, maybe I just need to move really, really far. So if you move order one away, then the, all the terms matter, but then optimization is probably difficult. You're really trying to optimize over the full parameter space. OK, so at this point, uh, you think about this. And then there's several options here that can sort of break the fact that uh, the, the linear term is dominant. You can add a lot, a lot of noise in a certain way to make f1 effectively not able to learn. You can regularize. Regularization will eventually cause you to move far away from the initialization. But 
Uh, it's not clear how to do this. If you have finite size, your, wet, your networks don't have t aren't very wide. It's probably possible that somehow the other terms start mattering because the linear term isn't necessarily dominant. And the last one is you can just train for a long, long time with logistic loss. And completely an asymptotic setting is you just realize that with exponential or logistic loss, eventually you have to move away. It's just we don't know how long and we don't know what happens in the middle. Okay, so these are all good ideas or reasonable ideas at least, but they're all mathematically quite difficult to execute. Uh, we'll do something that's some weird combination of one and two. Um, okay. So th this is a simple observation due to Alan Zhu, Li, and Liang. Uh, they don't explain it like this, but what they essentially mean, what they essentially observe in their paper is that it's not always the case F1 is bigger than F2. There are certain choices of weights where F2 can actually be bigger than F1. Uh, so let's try to find one such choice. Imagine your W is always some fixed matrix W times a random diagonal matrix. Then what will happen in the linear term is if you compute its standard deviation or variance, it will be b squared. And the second order term will be larger by a factor of square root m. And what happens is that if you think about a linear NTK back here, if you multiply this by a random diagonal matrix, there's cancellation from the random signs. So f1 is naturally scaled down. And then f2 has a chance of being larger now. Because if you have a random quadratic sign here, it gets squared and it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the observation of Alan Zhu, Li, and Li. Okay, so the noise and randomization can cause the linear term to be small. Um, in fact, so now you can optimize out to a radius of m to the minus one quarter. So in NTK, the usual scaling is a neuron moves one over square root m. Uh, for most of this talk, I'll be talking about one over m to one quarter, so slightly larger than how the weights move in NTK. In this regime, the second order term can predict an order one quantity, and it's larger than the linear term. Okay. So we force the algorithm to learn neural nets where the linear term is essentially negligible by doing SGD on a modified loss and with a regularizer. Uh, the purpose of modif the modifying a loss, like I said, is to sort of dampen out the linear term. The purpose of the regularizer is to make me not move more than m to the minus one quarter. Okay. So the questions we would like to ask now uh, are, th there's three questions essentially, is can you optimize over this? Can you find a global optimum in this region? Can you find a point of low training loss in this m to the minus one quarter region? Uh, is the network expressive in this region? So not really, I don't really care about the global expressiveness. I only care about the expressiveness in this region that I'm able to optimize over because I, I can't algorithmically use the rest of parameter space. And of course, what is the sample complexity? Um, where can you gain over, you know, just because you're optimizing over a larger region doesn't necessarily mean you gain in sample complexity. Okay. Uh, so the first thing to do is quite straightforward, given that we know about NTK, is to simply realize that in the region of m to the minus one quarter, you can replace the network with a quadratic approximation. So before we were replacing it with F1, now I replace it with F2. Instead of looking at just the gradient, I now have to look at the gradient and the Hessian agree um, of these two models. Okay, so what does this mean? For those three questions, I don't have to look at the original network. I can now look at the second order approximation, and it's much simpler than looking at the original network. I only need to look at optimization, sample complexity, and the local expressiveness of this F2 guy, and that, that is much simpler. Okay, so for optimization, what can we show? Uh, so what we can show is on that regularized loss, you find the global minimum within a parameter space region of this m to the minus one quarter, and SGD can find a global min. Uh, the optimization landscape is not convex, and unlike NTK, it's not locally convex anymore. There is none convexity since you're over a much larger set, and there is, uh, it's nonlinear. However, every second order stationary point is good, and you can use SGD to find global optimum here. Okay, uh, 
Um, the expressiveness, I won't say too much about the expressiveness, except that uh, it's roughly the same as NTK. Uh, from John's talk, you probably remember this sort of integral representation of functions. Uh, you have some nonlinear function, your activation with two derivatives now, and you integrate a coefficient a of w, it's like the weight, and it's everything of this form can be expressed locally. Uh, nothing really surprising here. Okay. So let's look at, uh, so I've taken the network and I've approximated it with this guy F2, and let's look at what F2 looks like. So F2, I've written it more suggestively as the inner product of theta, where theta, the rth coordinate of theta, is a rank one matrix, wr, wr transpose, and I have a certain feature map, psi sub r of x. Essentially think of this like as the random feature embedding of your, um, induced by the neural network. And you have something linear in this feature map. Uh, and I've tried to write it in a way to parallel the usual NTK developments. Again, phi here is a feature and you have an inner product. Okay, so this seems kind of weird. Uh, both methods seem like a linear classifier in a certain feature space induced by the neural network. So what the heck, why am I doing this? Seems I've gained nothing, right? So is it actually different from a kernel method? Okay, uh, and then if you carefully think about this, you'll realize the inductive bias is actually quite different. Um, let me try to explain what I mean here. Consider if you're in a parameter regime, something like this, a very standard scaling, and you want to look at the Rademacher complexity now. Uh, typically, so now the key is here, instead of theta, my parameter constraint is on Ws. And this here is WW transpose, so it's not linear in W anymore. So what happens is that I have a constraint on this guy, the Frobenius norm of these Ws, that translates to a nuclear norm thing over here. And then over here, I can measure the data property in the spectral norm. Okay, so essentially contrast this to what happens in, uh, in a RKHS. Let's say I use an RKHS with exactly the same random feature scheme, and I replace this with a theta. Everything here is in the L2 sense, because everything is uh, Hilbert, uh, Hilbert space. Okay, so what happens here is essentially I've replaced the, everything L2 with like an L1 infinity thing, and then, uh, so what this leads to at the end is that if you have some assumptions on your data that are fairly mild, for example, if this covariance matrix is order one, so think about this is whenever the data covariance is something sigma, sigma has a constant condition number, so like say a multivariate Gaussian, but the eigenvalues are not like way off, they're like 100 and 0.01, uh, then the operator norm of this guy is actually going to be order one. But if you use a random feature scheme, sorry, a kernel method on the same random features, you would pick up a D here. Okay, so uh, the, the sort of the inductive bias you get from using a quadratic parameterization is that uh, you can utilize sort of these data assumptions here that when it's kind of it's not too far from isotropic, you can gain a dimension factor here. Okay, uh, so let me illustrate this via the examples I had talked about earlier. Um, for some of them, we can get to the sharp complexity. For example, in this two XOR case that I said, there's lower bounds for kernel methods, I need D squared samples because you essentially have to look at all pairs XI, XJ uh, to learn a two XOR. Uh, it can be learned with order of D samples now. And it's precisely XOR, 2 XOR can be written as like a rank 2 polynomial. It can be written in this form like with two terms or something. Okay, so more ge generally, if you have a target function uh, that's a, a monomial or polynomial, a homogeneous polynomial to the kth power, but this theta has some structure, so this theta is low rank, so it's like a sum of low rank, rank one tensors or something. You can learn with d to the k minus one samples, uh, and then NTK needs d to the k samples. 
Uh, for matrix completion, a similar thing. So matrix completion needs d r squared samples using this model. And NTK actually needs every single sample to be observed. So NTK does something particularly crazy on matrix completion, is that uh, the kernel becomes very, very degenerate. I think Nati will talk about this. And then you need to essentially see every single entry in matrix. If you apply the NTK method to matrix completion, you need to see every single entry to generalize. And here you need essentially kind of close to the information theoretic thing. You need dr squared. OK. OK, so then the natural question to ask is, OK, why stop at second order? Uh, what happens if we try to utilize more of the parameter space? Uh, so of course, we can do this. We just tailor expand to even higher orders. So for each order, I have a, a, a term that's like involves w to the kth power. Um, and then what happens is that, so if each parameter moves m to the minus 1 over 2k, then you can truncate at the kth term. For example, if I wanted to truncate at the third term, um, sorry, if I moved m to the minus 1 sixth, then I can truncate at the third term. If I utilize all of parameter space, then I need to keep all of these things. So given a certain distance initialization, we know how to couple the neural dy dynamics to th this guy here up to some truncation. OK. Um, so there's some good news. Uh, all of the results on local expressivity and sample complexity generalize the higher order. These higher order FKs, they're still expressive. Uh, they similarly have, can express all functions it written in that integral form I showed you. And they can benefit for learning polynomial, uh, homogeneous polynomials of this form theta times x tensor p. If you use the kth order expansion here under a nearly isotropic assumption on the kth moment tensor, then you can learn with d to the p minus k plus 1 samples. OK. So uh, if your target function is sort of these very structured monomials of high power, then you want to use these more high power terms, and you can improve a lot over using just a linear term. OK, the bad news is we don't know how to optimize for k bigger than greater or equal 3. Uh, OK, I guess for k equals 3, we know how to optimize, just not with SGD, using Rong's result on a third order, finding third order local minimums. We know how to do it for k equals 3. For k equals 4, it's impossible to have like a black box result uh, because f there's some hardness here in the fourth, fourth order. So, we don't know how to optimize, but the sample complexity and the expressiveness are good for the higher order models. Uh, we don't know how to prove SGD will do this. Yeah, we, we can say things, if you find the best one in m to the minus 1 over 2k, then blah, blah holds. We don't know how to show SGD does it. For k equals 3, using one of Rong's earlier algorithms, you can do this still. And then at 4, there's probably no black box result you can invoke because it's like um, fourth order saddles are hard. Uh, of course, perhaps with, with data assumptions, it's still, it's plausible. Uh, yes, okay. Wow, I'm finishing early. Okay, um, some concluding thoughts. Um, so using these higher order terms on the NTK gives us a systematic way to learn over larger regions of the parameter space. Um, in contrast to a lot of these results on training that, um, on the linear NTK, there's, so what linear NTK basically tells you is that there's global minimizers everywhere when you're over parameterized, in particular really close to where you start, but they may not be the ones we want to find. And then optimizing over larger regions, uh, at least for certain target functions, you can do better, like these low rank polynomials are one example. And that's all. <laughs>